I spent many months in the ICU and in care. Ideally, what happened on that day was the person who had taken care of me all of my life, I then became their caretaker. And man, I'll be honest with you, it, it was a struggle. Um, I was only at that time, oh my gosh, it seems like a lifetime, but I think at that time I was uh, 31 years old, 31 years old. And I couldn't believe that, you know, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a place where I had to take care of my parent. I had to go and be the power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney. I had to file for Medicaid and start managing retirement and take care of house expenses and, and speak with doctors, you know, as if I'm the parent, but I'm not. It's just a really weird place to be in. And oh, by the way, I had a newborn at the house. I had a young child at the house. I had a wife at the house. And by the way, sorry, you all, I'm at the airport. And oh, by the way, uh, my job was not necessarily where I wanted it to be. So I had like all of this stuff. And I will say that one of the things that I had to really realize is that uh, depression is real. Um, when you get into bad spots, that's a real thing. And that you can't always, you cannot always solve it by yourself. So for many years, I had to go to therapy um, sessions mm -hmm. to just kind of talk through what was happening with me. Um, I even dropped out of my doctoral program. Hey, everybody, I'm back with another episode of So What Success Stories. This time, I am talking to my long, long, long time long friend, time. Dr. Mario Brown. And Dr. Mario yes. is the Chief Talent Development Officer at First Horizon Bank. And here's a really cool thing about that. He got to create his own title. Absolutely. <laughs> he got absolutely. to create his own title. And he's doing a, an amazing job. But so Mario and I met probably 1998. Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Probably 1998 um, when I pledged and he pledged. Phi Beta Sigma, which I know he will talk about that and give them a shout out. Um, but I just remember Mario, um, early, early on, we were University of Memphis students. At the time, there were not at that many minority students. So we were a community kind of of ourselves and we were the Greek community too. And I just remember really cool things like, cause you were a leader and I was in leadership and we were always in the uh, brochure. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. We were all the time, all the time. That's I was right. like, they're me, they're Mario. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I still have those brochures too, by the so way. Do I. So do I, so do I. But I, I, that was when I first connected with you, Mario, and first recognized you as a leader. Um, and again, we were 18, 19, 20 years old, and here we are today. And I'm super excited to be talking to you, and I'm super proud of you. Super proud of you, and I can't wait to tell your story. So, Mario, tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. So, I keep it high level because I want to save the good stuff for the remaining of the interview today. So, I'm Mario Brown, a native Memphian. Memphis has always been my home, uh, born and raised here. I have um, my wife is Bridget. She's also a Memphis alum, and then I have three kids. Uh, Maya, Layla, and Zeke, who they are also Tigers because they attend University Middle, but also the campus school. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I always tell people that I was raised Catholic, but my entire family was Baptist. So that's the beginning of having perspective, right, which you'll hear about in just a second. Um, I, I honestly tried to leave Memphis for a little while, and hopefully later on I'll talk to you about why did I come back to the city and the place they gave so much to me and why I feel compelled to do that. Uh, today, I serve as the Chief Talent Development Officer for First Horizon, a $90 billion organization with more than 8,000 associates in the Southeast. And I love the job that I do. Every day, I have the opportunity to promote learning uh, and development experiences to help each of those associates just be a better version of themselves than they were today. And so uh, that, that is a journey and a process, but I'm super passionate about that. So I do that and then also take it back into the community too with the University of Memphis, uh, of course, an institution that has given so much to us. We started there as uh, Summer has mentioned, but a lot of us have gone on to many places. And so I'm so thankful for that partnership and the involvement with the university and the community uh, as well. I am a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, uh, come from the Delta Nu chapter, and I'm also part of the Tau Sigma chapter, which is the graduate chapter here in Memphis. 
Good stuff, Mario. And you mentioned the University of Memphis. And so both of one thing I didn't mention is both of us are board members yeah. of the National Alumni director. Association. That's exactly right. You are the former president of the Black Alumni Chapter. Yeah, you absolutely. did some amazing things uh, as the president of Black Alumni Chapter. And so absolutely. honored when, when I was president of the Alumni Association Board, you were a vice president. That's right. Yeah. And um, just continuing to give back, continuing to give back. Um, super, super excited to get in this. Okay, absolutely. so Mario. Okay. In this program, I have what I call the Soul with Success System. Yeah. It is my belief that if anyone can learn how to overcome obstacles, eliminate excuses, and calculate choices, they can have Soul with Success. And oh, that absolutely. is success in spite of anything that they go through. Absolutely. And Mario, you are absolutely. a proven yes. Soul with Success man. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about some of the obstacles that you've had to overcome and just how you've done it. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm trying to talk about um, two uh, for the purposes of this interview, one personal and then one professional. So the one that has affected me the most was um, the idea of being a caretaker for my mom. So I'll share the short story here. You know, in my professional career, when I came back to Memphis, I came back for a couple of reasons. Number one, we wanted to be around our family. Number two, I knew that there was a lot of opportunity for me to advance and give back to the city that had given so much to me. And when I came back, we also began to establish our family. This was a couple of years ago. And I remember one day being, as my wife would tell me, you know, being a boy is different than being a girl. Like, you know, boys don't necessarily check in with their parents like they're supposed to. You know, girls are always <laughs> usually on top of those types of things. And so I remember we had our first child and uh, I was getting off of work and I ended up calling to my wife was like, we need to go see your mom. So I called. And uh, when I called, the uh, sheriff's department in Robinsonville picked up the phone. I'm like, what's happening here? So I ended up finding out that my mom had a severe stroke while she was driving. And that is a day that I never, ever forget. Um, it was very surreal. It was almost kind of like you were in a euphoric kind of state. Um, just everything was going fast and slow at the same time. Um, and I remember going into the hospital Oh, I'll back up. So anybody that knows about stroke, which is real, especially among the African-American community, you know, time to the hospital is of the utmost important importance. My mom had her stroke while she was driving and she was 40 minutes away from the closest hospital. And so she was well past that time barrier that was important for her to kind of get the services she needed to get to some type of operable state. Long term short, I spent many months in the ICU and in care. Ideally, what happened on that day was the person who had taken care of me all of my life, I then became their caretaker. And man, I'll be honest with you, it, it was a struggle. Um, I was only at that time, oh my gosh, it seems like a lifetime, but I think at that time I was uh, 31 years old, 31 years old. And I couldn't believe that, you know, I'm... I'm in, a, I'm in a place where I had to take care of my parent. I had to go and be the power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney. I had to file for Medicaid and start managing retirement and take care of house expenses and, and speak with doctors, you know, as if I'm the parent, but I'm not. It's just a really weird place to be in. And oh, by the way, I had a newborn at the house. I had a young child at the house. I had a wife at the house. And by the way, sorry, you all, I'm at the airport. And oh, by the way, uh, my job was not necessarily where I wanted it to be. So I had like all of this stuff. And I will say that one of the things that I had to really realize is that uh, depression is real. Um, when you get into bad spots, that's a real thing. And that you can't always, you cannot always solve it by yourself. So for many years, I had to go to therapy um, sessions mm -hmm. to just kind of talk through what was happening with me. Um, I even dropped out of my doctoral program. I don't know if people even know that you all, I had finished. I, first of all, let, let me just share a funny, a bright note in the midst of this story. You know, I had a wonderful time at the University of Memphis. Someone will attest to that. And other people <laughs> who went to. Um, I graduated with a computer engineering technology degree. And it took me five and a half years to complete that degree. I finished my doctorate in four years. Okay. But let me tell you, in a doctoral program, the last phase that you have is really your oral defense. All of the hard stuff is done. It's just at that point, you stand there and you kind of share from knowledge, you know, not without notes, anything that you really know uh, all of the learnings that come out of the program and that you know what you need to do going forward. Well, you all, I was done. I was done with everything except for the oral defense, but the weight of everything in the world 
uh, sat on me so hard that I sent an email to the universe and said, I quit. I'm dropping out. It didn't matter that I had a fellowship from the University of Memphis and this degree was totally paid for. It didn't matter that I had done all of this work in four years. Think about it, a doctorate in four years. I went full time every single semester. None of that mattered. And I said, I quit. And, and that's how you know it was real, right? Mm -hmm. To just kind of give up on hard work like that. There are so many people out here with ABDs who try for years and years and years. And here I am, you know, in my moment quitting. And all I had to do was stand up and say, here's what I know. So it was a very rough time. I'm not going to lie. For years, I struggled with it for almost six or seven years. I mean, we're about 12 years into me being her caretaker, and it was not um, an easy thing to overcome. But, you know, there was a moment, which I share this story all the time, and I even told my mom, I said, hey, I'm not in a really good place. Um, I'm trying my best. And you never feel like you do the best, right, for your parents. You never feel like you're doing enough, no matter if you're giving all of your time and energy. And I remember one day I talked to her about this and I said, I, I really hate to share this with you because I feel like I need to keep this to myself because actually you're the one, you know, that's in a, um, in a state where she, uh, I, I forgot to tell you all that when she had the stroke, she became completely paralyzed, you all. So I'm her official caretaker. So she can no longer do anything by herself. She's total care. And so anyhow, we have this conversation and she says, listen, I have taught you better in so many words. She said, I have taught you better. You have a family. You have to keep going. You've worked too hard. You have to keep pushing. Like this song says, keep on pushing. <laughs> so I did, right? I did. I said, you know what? I'm gonna get myself together. This is life. Uh, I have to acknowledge your reality instead of providing all these excuses of why I can't do this and why I can't do that. Because to be honest, Summer, just like you mentioned earlier, I was telling myself a lot of excuses about why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? And I always had this excuse of, oh, because I'm a caretaker. Oh, because I'm upset. Oh, because I'm depressed. And I had to realize that that's not the way to live. And if I continue to do that, I would always be stuck in a miserable job, in a miserable place in my life, not being able to do well. So I had to bring myself out let of it. Let me life. ask you this, Mario. Yeah, if we, let, 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 we can continue the story and the excuses. Absolutely. Okay. I want to I wanna know you mentioned mental health and therapists and yeah. um and i'm so power i'm so glad you said that because it's so powerful and it's so necessary talk about some other ways that you you were able to overcome those yeah. obstacles absolutely so a couple of things i had to do you all was number one realize what were my triggers and what was really getting me down right and why was it sending me to a very dark place the other thing i had to do was balance that with the reality so i had to think to myself mario what can you actually control and what can you not control? And so I wanted to focus on the things that I could control and realize that those other things, they can exist, but I could not spend my time and energy on them because it was wasted energy. The other thing that I ended up doing was I started doing mindfulness. Um, I had an app that my therapist told me to get called Headspace, which at first it took me a minute to get into it, but after a while, it was great. It allowed me to kind of check out, center my thoughts, focus on what I needed to focus on, be better at time management, and then the other thing that I did was try to get myself out of that environment. So long story short, I did go back and finish my doctorate because my major professor came to the hospital and said, listen, you can have your moment, but you are going to finish this doctor. You are African-American male at this institution um, pursuing a doctorate. We're going to finish this. It may not be right now, but we're going to finish. So I'm going to put this on hold to whenever you're ready. And I said, OK, thank you, Dr. Wilson. I appreciate it. So also what I had to do was get myself out of the same spaces that I was in. To be honest. Um, during that time, I let go of some friends. I don't know if I should say let go, but I may have moved away from some people who, you know, call themselves friends or whatever the case may be or associates. Um, I had to go find things to do to help my mind just kind of be at ease, activities that I appreciated, get back to the things that I wanted to do. So those were a couple of things I started to do to help me move out. I still continue therapy in a different way. Um, I am more, as I've gotten older, I am more willing to be open with other people to ask them questions about me or things of the world and trying to process that. Whereas normally I would have kept those things to myself. Like, I'll be honest with you. Um, I was at work the other day and for the first time I, I had failed to mention this, but I have ADHD and mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know that. And I think when I said it one day on a call in the enterprise at First Horizon, we were talking about mental health. I said, just to let you all know, I have ADHD. 
And I'm not ashamed of it. A couple of years ago, I think I would have been really ashamed to tell people that. Um, but, you know, as you get older, you become more comfortable in the skin that you are and realize that, you know, you are enough as you are and just do the things. That, and you, you got to stop hiding. It, I think that's the bad part is when you hide, that's when it has more detrimental effects on your mental health than you just kind of showing up as your true self. You know what, Mario? <laughs> I, I love that you said one of the things that you did was essentially the serenity prayer. Yeah. And that's what so what is <laughs> based it. on is accepting <laughs> what you can change and changing what you can. That's it. Focusing yeah. your energy on what you can change. And, and, I, and I love how Never you said thought that. about that. That's that, right. <laughs> that's essentially what you did. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly what I how I created so what. And so you had that so what moment and you made some changes. And I and I think that's awesome and it's amazing. I like how you also said you had to make um change some relationships. Yes. And some <laughs> dynamics of relationships. And that's powerful. Sometimes it can be hard. It and sometimes be. it can be hard, but not, but that's something you did. Talk about the professional example that you wanted to share. Yeah, so professionally, you all, I, I had a lot of struggle um, just trying to figure out where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do. And then there were some people and processes, too, that I think got in my way. So I'll give one example. I've always wanted to, from my time at University of Memphis, be what's called a vice president of student affairs. You and I both know and love Dr. Carson. I just thought, you know what, that is an awesome role to be in. And I think that is something that my life purpose would match. And uh, I did everything I I, I was I understood to do you know you had to have a terminal degree you needed to have this experience and um you know it was very unfortunate i was at an institution and i saw the opportunity for us to really advance this idea of student student life and student development and so me and the team we got together and wrote out this awesome proposal gave it to the president and part of it was saying you know we need a vice president of student affairs that is grounded in this knowledge and information to lead the way around these objectives and the president accepted the proposal and it was awesome and uh, ideally, I wanted to apply for, but this happened at the same time that my mom had the stroke. I had complete finish. So I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be good in this space. And I need a good person to be in a good headspace to lead us now. But one day, uh, my, my, my supervisor at that time, unsolicited, came and said, hey, we think you will be an awesome candidate. We've seen you work. We know how you show up. Um, you know these ideas. You have to write it. We think it'd be great. And I said, okay, all right. So I applied for it. And then a couple of, uh, like a month later, uh, that supervisor came back to my office and said, hey, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay, because I'm like, okay, this is the moment. And he basically said, we decided not to consider you at all for the position. And somewhere at that moment, I just felt, man, I felt betrayed. I felt, I don't, it was all kind of words in my mind. I didn't cut up, I didn't act the fool. Uh, the next day, I kindly wrote a note to the school um, and thanked them for all of the time and experience that I had. And I quit summer with no job. I left. Mm -hmm. Remember, that was when the time I was um, trying to talk to a therapist. So I knew I could not have additional stress in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I kindly, kindly quit and said, hey, anything that is owed to me, you all can have it. This has been a great institution. I personally have to move on. And that was that was huge for me. And at that moment, I realized that professionally, I cannot wait and hope for someone else to grant me the the the, the position or the places of where I know I'm supposed to be. Right. I can't put all of my eggs in my manager's basket and say, once they promote me, I'm going to be excited or waiting for somebody to tap me on my shoulder. I was the one that was at fault and I needed to take advantage of that. So I did. I quit. Um, I did a little regrouping. Um, I ventured out out of education, which was scary as heck, and applied for a job. But you know what also is good about showing up professionally is that when I applied for the job at First Tennessee Bank at that time, what I did not know was that the person who was recruiting me had previously worked in the higher education arena. And you know, it's pretty small. And what I love about it was the recruiter called all the people that they knew in Memphis and asked about me. I had no idea this was going on. And all of those individuals had great things to say about me. And she told me when she hired me, she said, I'm hiring you because you have a great reputation. Every time I talk to people, they said that you showed up well, and that's the kind of person we needed to bank. Um, and I will say at First Tennessee, First Horizon, they still have had challenges. But I think, again, as you become more resilient and you learn what's necessary for resiliency, those things don't bother you as much. You just kind of like, you know what? 
going to accept this challenge and love the responsibility and I'm going to keep on moving because I got this. <laughs> you know, I got this. You know, I back love in the it. day, right? <laughs> I'm going to keep it moving. I love it. I love it, Mario. So much. Um, look, I'm trying to remember everything I was going to say because you, that, that was powerful. That was powerful. You took control of your career. You took control of your life. You didn't sit and you didn't wait. You know, I know some about that too. Yes, you do. <laughs> I yes, love you do. it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I, I also like how you said, I think it's important for people watching this to think about the reputation, how your reputation and things you had done before. Yes. Before you even knew these people and knew they would be talking to other people Absolutely. is what puts you in a position where you were Absolutely. able to get this job. That's it. And the, uh, the other thing that I thought about Mario was a story I actually like to tell. And I'll tell it quickly because we want to talk about your story Okay. Uh, is when I first graduated from school, from the University of Memphis, and you know, I was like, I'm good, right? Yeah, I had yeah, yeah, yeah. almost a 4.0 GPA. I was Miss University of Memphis. I'd done an internship. Do you know I had the hardest time finding a job? I had the yeah. hardest time yes. finding a job. Even getting an interview. Yeah. Even getting an interview. I finally started getting interviews, and I got interview an interview with Enterprise Rent a Car. Mm. Management and, training program. Yes. Ah. And so that's how everybody starts. And I went on four interviews um, at the same time I was interviewing at an advertising agency, which was more aligned to what I wanted to do because I had a marketing degree and it was more aligned to that. Neither had given me an offer. By the fourth interview, I got an offer mm. at Enterprise. And I really wanted to work at the advertising agency. So I had just taken this negotiation class my senior year. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, I'm go back to the advertising agency, tell them, well, I've got an offer now. What you gonna do? <laughs> right. They made an offer. It was like $19,000, no benefits. And I had my child. I was like, okay, let me go on back over here to Enterprise. And they did essentially what would happen with you. I thought that was secure. And they told me they were, they were considering other candidates. Yep, yep. They had already made me an offer. So I learned a hard lesson at that point too. I learned a lot of lessons. But soon after that though, and the main point of this is the Memphis Grizzlies moved to Memphis. That's right. And I got a job and, and got the best job I think I could have ever had to start my career. So okay. all things work together. So even, yes, that, thing, even that turn down and the same thing with you and you not getting that position, you were not supposed to get that position. Right. You were not supposed to get okay, right. well, before we get too deep in it. So yeah. the next part of the solo success system is is eliminating excuses. Yes. And you already alluded to some of the yes excuses you had to eliminate. But Mario, um, one thing we didn't mention in the intro is you also are a distinguished uh, alumni award yes. winner at Absolutely. the University of Memphis. And I never will forget that when you got that award, and I, I mean, and I knew you, I've known you since we were kids, essentially. Yeah. But when you were on that stage and you were giving that speech, I felt like I really got to know you. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't know, you know, about your background and growing up yeah. without your father and right. all those things. So anyway, talk about some of the excuses you've had to get uh, get past to become Dr. Mario, Chief oh Talent gosh. Development Officer, great father, <laughs> great husband. Talk about some of those excuses you had to get rid of. Oh, my gosh. Every time I hear that, or I even say it to myself, I'm like, thank you, God, because you you think about all the excuses that you've said over your life. Um that if you believe them, you wouldn't have been there. So yes, um, there were so many excuses. You know, I looked around, I'll, I'll tell you, to be honest, coming to the University of Memphis was a shocker for me. Well, let me back up. We used to stay in Dixie Homes. And so even when I moved to Whitehaven, that was a shocker for me. I could not believe the amenities that people had. And I always felt like I was less than, right? Um, and then I went to a Catholic church where you see a different type of, uh, people in Memphis. And again, I felt like I was a have not, like, why don't I have this? And why didn't I get that? And then I do think the biggest one is I, I, I had a sense of jealousy around people who had fathers in a home. Like I really wanted that. Uh, my brother is 10 years older than me and anybody who has a sibling and that's far apart, it, you might as well be part of two different families in most cases, because they are living a whole different life. So I had always yearned for that. And I used that as an excuse for a long time. But I turned the excuse into something else. One of the reasons why I joined the fraternity was because I saw how amazing it was. I would have close connections with people. There were fraternity brothers who literally acted as fathers. Um, it was all the things that I really wanted. 
And so um, I turned that excuse around. But you know, the other excuse that I tend to, I, I used to use was me being a black male. I used that excuse so many times. I think I was convincing myself that I was not enough. It wasn't other people. You know what I'm saying? I think after a point I had started convincing myself that I couldn't instead of other people. Um, another excuse I think is the one that I still have to balance to this day. And it's, it's in a different form, but I think the more you move forward in life and the more you achieve, you have a, a greater sense at times of what's called imposter syndrome. Because for you, you've kind of gone through these exercises and routines and these ups and downs, and you truly are at that place and people see it. But for you, it still is like surreal a little bit. You know what I'm saying? And it's kind of like, okay, am I really ready? Uh, am I really uh, worthy? I remember when I was promoted to chief talent development officer, I emailed my boss and said, are you sure about this? But even in that point, I shouldn't even say it there, right? That was me almost kind of saying, Mario, you're not even sure if you're ready for this. And you know what she said, which I love. And I was like, get your mind right, sir. She said, yeah, I'm sure. I've been sure. I was sure before I, I even told you this. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Well, hell, if she's sure, I need to be sure too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, so the thing and is- And we laugh, Mario, but that's so real. It's so real. It's so and, real. And, I mean, I'm there too. And especially when you come from, not having that example like you yeah. said you grew up exactly. without that example exactly. i grew up without that example and we both been really really blessed yeah to to be in positions that i never dreamt of and i you know and yeah. to be surrounded by amazing people like you yeah. who i never would dream would be in my circle yeah um and have, so i get it imposter syndrome is real and it's something that we all deal with talk about a little bit how, how you dealt with that so one you already said it like okay if she believe me i need to believe it yeah what's what else do you do to deal so with a couple that? of things i'll share and I, I practice this myself so anything i tell people i'm practicing it myself one of the things that i always tell my students now i try to put it into analogy and saying that every day we are writing the stories of our lives you know we are the authors of our own lives we've heard that analogy we're writing the sentences and pages every single day and chapters come along with that. But when we do blaming other people for reasons why we didn't or weren't able to do things, we do all these excuses that you're talking about. Here's what is happening. You are literally taking your pen that you have been granted and you're passing on to an unknown author who is now writing your story for you. And I know that's not what people want. That's not what I want. In other words, you're rendering yourself powerless. And that's not where anybody wants to be. All of us wants to be, all of us want to be powerful. So what do you do, right? You acknowledge the reality of where you are. You uh, start thinking about solutions, right? You get on with it, right? And you move forward. That's what you do. You want to remain powerful. You want to continue to write your story. So that's what I do. One of the things I do now every morning, there's a great book by a lady named Mel Robinson, and it's called The High Five Habit. And what she talked about is in the morning, when people get up, the first thing they do maybe is go to the restroom. And you know what people do? Oh my gosh, I don't look this way. Oh my gosh, I should be further along in life. Oh my gosh, I should da da da. We say all this negative soft talk, self talk to ourselves early in the morning. But what people don't know is neurologically, that's rewiring your brain to believe those things. So even when, even later on that day, three hours later, somebody tells you, you are great. I'm so proud of how far you've come in your life and your age, this, that, and the other. You don't believe that stuff yourself because you've already convinced yourself that morning that you're not those things. So she said, and I do this as well, you have to rewire, you have to do your own self-talk and rewire yourself. So in the morning, talk about how great you are. Give yourself a high five. I'm great today. This is going to be a fantastic day. I am accomplished. You know, just like the movie, I am smart. I am kind. Whatever you got to say to yourself, right? <laughs> so those are some of the things I do to just make sure I stay out of that dark space and keep it moving forward. I love it. I love it. And yeah. that is so true. I have, um, I don't know if you knew or not, but I have an online confidence class. Okay. And in my confidence class, it's a lot of what I what I teach too is, is looking in the mirror because yeah. sometimes... That's the hardest thing for people to do. And when we do it, what do we do? We first see all the things that uh -huh. are wrong uh -huh. Uh -huh. instead of the beautiful right. smile that you have and the fact that you can smile. Celebrate and you what's right. That's right. So, I love it. I love yes, it. Absolutely. So the next part of so a success system is calculating choices. Mm -hmm. and Mario, you have made some choices. <laughs> yes, I have. Yes, I have. <laughs> Talk about some of the calculated choices you made, you've made on your journey. 
Yeah, absolutely. So one calculated choice was you are, I had to come to the realization, I love education and that's still what I do today. I mean, think about it. I went from computer engineering to education. That's how much I am invested in this. And one of the things I understood was, you know, family is very important to me. My wife is a nurse. Uh, she really wanted to stay in the city that we grew up in and love. But I knew in this education spirit, there was going to be some limitations. So I took a risk. I knew that I had a, a skill set, not necessarily sure where it could transfer to, but I was going to take a chance. And so I calculated and I said, you know what, let me go out here to corporate America. I know that they can benefit from somebody like me to bring something to the table. And so you all, that has been one of the best risks I have ever taken. Another thing that I have um, started to do is really venture out into um, what I call unknown spaces. Like I like to play in sandboxes that I don't know anything about. At the bank, there's a lot to learn, but you know what I do? I go in the meetings, I'm like, oh, we're talking about commercial banking today? I have no idea, but I'm gonna sit here and figure it out. And after a while, I'm gonna come back and have a good conversation with you about this, almost as if I'm an associate of the commercial bank. So every moment I'm trying to figure out what's my next learning step and I take a risk. Um, now I will say that some of those risks may come back to hunt you later on. Like you may be too like risky, but you know what? That's the part of it, that's life. You know what I'm saying? Like if you don't take that risk, you'll never learn that that's not a good risk to take. Uh, another risk that I also have um, started to take, which I'll be honest, coming from my background, I was not educated on this well, is just around finances too. Like how to you know, invest in the stock market and how to use a, a Roth IRA or a 401k. Uh, all of those things can be risky, um, especially in terms of when you're trying to think about how to you know, live in the moment and live life and balance your finances and then kind of bidding on the future. Um, but in the end, Summer, uh, there have been some ups and downs, but I will tell you, honestly, I haven't regretted not one risk um, that has been taken um, because they all were thoughtful. One of the things I have stopped doing because I'm not in my 20s anymore, and I'm not saying that 20 year olds do this, so forgive me, <laughs> in the 20s, but I am very, very calculated and thoughtful about the risk that I want to take. So if I'm doing it, you better know that I have thought about it. It wasn't like I woke up today and was like, yep, I'm going to go do that. <laughs> nope, I thought about that and the four steps that'll come after that if it works out. That's awesome. You know what? You you use the word risk. Sometimes our choices are risky. Um, yes, and then also thought about, you know, we have some classmates that I've, I had the honor of interviewing who know the financial world. So I trust them with my stuff. Yes, I know, right? <laughs> really, really proud of them again. The beautiful circle that was created by these relationships that I made. Right and maintain so you know that's a lesson find that's people it. smarter than you to help you do some of the things you like to know everything <laughs> surround yourself with them that's right surround yes, yes yes and mario you you also made the choice to get your doctorate i did so let's, we can't we can't just you know go right past that so we talked about you know you thought about quitting and I the did. challenge with that but you also made the choice to start so talk yes. about that why you so, did that and so how that's exactly right. So I made the choice to start, to be really honest, because I was thinking about the long term um, wellness of my family. So all I do is for my family. So I knew that in order to have the best opportunity to have the knowledge, to have the confidence and expertise to kind of move and shake like I wanted to, this was a credential that I really wanted to take on. And it was very risky. And I'll be honest with you, because a doctorate is not cheap at all. Number one, I started the program with no financial aid whatsoever. But to the grace of Dr. Karen Widow West, we found out about a um, a uh, fellowship that was offered at the university. And I didn't get it the first time because it's only a few people. But afterwards, I got that fellowship. And it was kind of like, oh, my gosh, OK, now the risk is that with my mom having a stroke, I had all three of my kids while I was pursuing a doctorate. Um, I had quit a job while pursuing my doctorate. Um, I had started a new job while pursuing my doctorate. Um, we had moved to a new house. Like all of this stuff happened while I was pursuing the doctorate. Um, and so it was a huge risk. I'll be honest, like I said, there were ups and downs. There are times because I did, I was so intentional about getting that done. So I kept that goal in my mind, but there was a, I don't know if there was a downside to it. So unfortunately, because there were so many things that were happening to me at that time, there are periods during my doctoral uh, time that I don't remember. Like I have zero recollection recollection of. My wife reminds me all the time of kind of how I showed up during that time. Um, but what I will say, I am very thankful today of the commitment that I made to do that because I think it has propelled me 
to where I am today to allow for many opportunities back to the main goal of what I talked about earlier. So in terms of the taking care of my family, I'm going to be honest, I am so grateful that I'm not worried at all today. <laughs> I love it. I right love it. Thing. I love it. And, and look, just as a plug, we're getting ready to go to Hawaii. The whole family is getting yeah, ready to go to Hawaii. That's right. Huge <laughs> blessings. Huge blessings. And it's worth saying Huge again blessings. because we, you and I both know that those were not opportunities we had as children. Mm -hmm. And it was because of God, and we I, we both give God honor Absolutely. and credit, but Absolutely. also the path and the choices that you've made. Yes. The Absolutely. path and the choices that you made. And I think that's amazing, Mario. So you, oh, my you. friend, are definitely a so what success man. You know how to overcome obstacles, eliminate excuses, and calculate choices so that you can be sitting in the airport right now because you're traveling for work and doing what <laughs> you right. do, doing what <laughs> you do. Absolutely. But Absolutely. Mario, what is your personal definition of success? Yes. So I think my personal definition of success will be um, a person who has truly given it their all, uh, tried new experiences, and learned something from them. That's it. I like That's that. That's really it. Yeah. If you I learn like something that. from your yeah, if you learn something from your experience, you're successful because you can use that knowledge to go even further the next time around. And you said, and truly giving it your all. That's a barometer of it, too, is you have to That's be right. true Give to it your yourself all. that you have given it your all. That's right. Okay, one last question for you. I'll let hey. you go so you can get on your flight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's one piece of advice you would give to someone who wants to be successful, but they have some sort of challenges? What's, what would you tell them? Yep. So what I would say to someone who really wants to be successful and are experiencing significant challenges, here's what um, my line brother, his name is Mowbray Rowan, who is very successful living in Atlanta, uh, doing a very good job, is that you will never have any, any more on you than you can ever bear. We've heard that all the time. In the moment, it can seem very dark, very challenging, very much like, you know, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. But well, here's what you should know. Anything that is um, worth it, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. So whenever you see those challenges, just think about, listen, at the end, I'm going to be so good that this right here is going to be so worth it. And I'm going to enjoy it even more. So I, like I said, I love the challenge and I accept the responsibility each and every time, no matter how much it gets on my nerves. I'm like, you got this. You've been here before. It's going to be fine. And we're going to enjoy it at the end. <laughs> on that note mario i thank you so much for all this wisdom that you've given i'm so grateful for your smile i am grateful that, that 20 plus years we are still yes. connected and we have grown together and learned together um and we are still giving back to the university of memphis who has I that the so. university has really shaped both of us yes, um, it has. and again great. i just have to close with i'm super proud of you i know your mom you. is super proud of you thank you and um and, and i i just thank you i love you mario i love you too